Welcome to Sisterhood Conference 2018. At this year's conference, we have an amazing lineup of speakers and presenters from across Australia and around the world, sharing with us their incredible wisdom and insight. We're so glad you can join us. Sisterhood Conference 2018. I have with me Father Ken Barker, who is preparing to deliver the keynote tonight. Father Ken, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Lovely to be here. You've been part of Sisterhood, Father Ken, for many years now. You've been the resident priest at our Sisterhood conferences. How significant is Sisterhood, the Sisterhood Conference, for women in the church here in Australia? Well, I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I think it's quite unique, really. And because it's a, a conference that's not just sort of a talk fest, it's actually inviting women into a deeper relationship with the Lord. And, and so many, I think, have had their hearts touched by that. That's what's, what excites me most, is that uh, especially tonight, people will really open up to the Lord. They'll have the sacrament of reconciliation, and then they'll come into a place of deeper surrender to God in their hearts. And that, that's transforming stuff, for not only for them, but for their, their family, uh, the children that they have especially, uh, and the sphere of influence, whatever they have within uh, schools or universities or uh, some sort of organisation they're part of or some business that, that they're in. It, so it's a wonderful thing. It, it has a huge impact, I think, way beyond what we can even imagine. Yeah. Can you give us a sneak peek into what you're speaking about tonight? Oh, well, tonight it's really a call. It's a call to a deeper surrender to the Lord. It's a call to acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord, is the Lord of your life and it's an invitation to really surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it's really a, a response uh, to all that's been presented already by wonderful speakers. Yeah. Well, Father Ken Barker from the Missionaries of God's Love, thank you so much. So do not be afraid. <laughs> it's certainly there all the time, isn't it? And another thing, of course, we do find shame, don't we? In the middle of the night, we can wake up feeling shame or before others when they look upon us in the way they sometimes do it can make us feel less and tear us down how beautiful it is that jesus took all our shame upon himself when he hung on the cross now he died a shameful death for you and me so that shame would be undone he hung on that cross as a criminal, condemned to death. It was for you and me, he took that shame upon himself so that when you look to him and his holy wounds, you will find freedom from shame. At the foot of the cross, we all stand very equal. No one is superior to anyone else. At the foot of the cross, each one if we are truthful, knows that everything depends upon Jesus. Each one knows he or she cannot take a superior place because each is totally dependent upon the blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross. And at times, too, we can feel forgotten and overlooked, as was presented there so beautifully. And those words in Isaiah 49 where the Lord says, I'll never forget you. Even if a mother should forget the child in her womb, and oh my goodness, how could that happen? But it does happen in today's world. A great sorrow in the hearts of all of us. Maybe the sorrow in the hearts of some here who just for a moment did forget. But the Lord says, even if the woman should forget the child in her womb, or the one at her breast, I'll never forget you. The promise of the Lord is there for us at all times. He will never forget us. So I celebrate that uh, beautiful presentation. The experience of God's love is what each one of us needs more than anything else, myself included, because we have inside of ourselves a tendency to doubt the love of God. There's something inside us that 
finds it difficult sometimes to really receive that love. It might be the wound of rejection that we've experienced in the past. I remember a young man coming to me and telling me his story. He had been so rejected by his father that as he grew into his teenage years, he decided that he'd shoot his father. He'd actually got the gun and he was on the way out the door to do it. And as he walked out the door, he looked up and he saw a picture of the Sacred Heart, which he hadn't noticed there before. <laughs> and there was something about that picture, the heart of Jesus, because the heart of Jesus is pierced for us on the cross and he loves us so much. Something about that picture just captured him for a moment and it stopped him from doing such a dastardly deed. And he said that after that, he felt a need. And so he came to a prayer meeting. And at the prayer meeting, the preacher was preaching Jesus crucified. And, and he preached it in such a way that it really touched this man's heart. And at the end of it, there was a call. The preacher said, anyone who wants to open his heart to Jesus tonight, come forward. Well, this young fellow didn't know what that meant, but he felt like a compulsion inside of himself to come forward. So he came right out the front. He said to me that prior to this time, he'd said to his best friend that the hole in his heart felt so deep that not even all the oceans of the world would fill up this hole. And now here he is at the front. And the preacher says, well, what do you want for prayer for? He said, I want what you've got. And so he said, do you want to know Jesus? He said, yes, yes, whatever that means. Tell me how to do that. And so he led him through a prayer of commitment to Jesus. And as they prayed over him, he said, that hole in the heart was being filled up to overflowing. Now, of course, there's a lot of work after that that had to happen. But he'd come into the experience of God's immense love. And that's what we're all hungering for. I've listened to many stories over the weekend and everybody's story, at the bottom of it, there's this deep hunger for more of the Lord's love. True? It's there. And it's there in my heart too. I've received the immense love of the Lord, uh, but there's so much more. It is an ocean of love that he wants us to experience. And so let's tonight really open up to the experience of his saving love, one for us on the cross. You know, um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I was invited by leaders of the Charismatic Renewal to go to a meeting in Bethlehem, of all places. Well, of course, I said yes, because they were paying the way. But, uh, <laughs> and I very quickly said yes. And, and and it was a meeting of uh, people who have prophetic uh, insight. I wasn't invited because of that, but <laughs> for some other reason. <laughs> so we gathered in this, it was a hotel right next to the place where Jesus was born. So on the particular night that we were meant to especially seek the Lord for his mind for the next um, you know, 20 or 30 years or whatever it is of the renewal in the world, we were from different countries, I think uh, 50 or so countries represented. And so we were there uh, seeking the Lord, and then all of a sudden the lights went out, as it sometimes happens in those countries. The lights just went out, and we were in darkness. And I thought, well, that'd be it. We'd have to pack up and um, forget about the whole idea. But some woman who has a strong prophetic vo voice, she, she stood up and she said, yes, we're in darkness, but... Let's seek the Lord. And she likened it to a time right back in 1967 when the beginning of the charismatic renewal in a place in uh, Pittsburgh uh, in Pennsylvania at the Duquesne University. Some young university students had gone off for a, a weekend. And on this weekend, uh, they were expectant of something happening, of the Holy Spirit coming in some way. So they were eager for that because they read the Acts of the Apostles. And she, she reminded us of this weekend and she said on that weekend the water stopped in the place where they were and so they decided they'd have to probably go home but they had a, a, a birthday party to celebrate so they celebrated the birthday party that night and while they were in the middle of that 
uh, all of a sudden people just started to disappear. And they ended up upstairs in the chapel because the Lord was drawing them independently to the chapel and they got so filled with the Spirit that they were flat on their faces before the Blessed Sacrament and, and just overwhelmed with the love of God. And that was the beginning of a whole renewal that went right through the Catholic world. Now we estimate you know, 200 million or so people have experienced this renewal. And this movement here is sort of part of all that. So as she reminded us of that moment that the water had gone off. And then what happened is after the Holy Spirit was poured out, the water came back on again, which is like a sign of you know, God's uh, pouring out his Spirit. And so we said, okay, well, let's pray. So we sought the Lord and we praised the Lord and everything like that in the dark. But there was a little bit of visibility. So one of the guys, really strong sort of guy, because there was a very large crucifix on the back wall. And he got inspired to take down the crucifix and hold it up before us, you know. And so we could see it through the, the darkness. We could see the cross, you know, just see the shape of it there. And we're praising the Lord and going on. And then someone else got a word. And the word was very simple. It went something like this. We are obviously in darkness. We are helpless. We have no way to find the light. But the Lord would have us turn to his cross. And he, he put his arm out like this. He said, he'd turn to his cross. And before he could say it, that we will have the light, the lights came on. <laughs> Praising the Lord. But it was, I think, it was a prophecy in action. A prophecy in action that when we're hopeless and in the darkness, right, we turn to the cross of Jesus, right, and draw from his love, which brings light to our lives. That's what the Lord wants more than anything else. And so we spent the rest of the afternoon, the evening, where it was, we, we spent the rest of the time just sort of surrendering ourselves to Jesus, who gave himself completely for us on the cross just yielding our lives over to him. And it was just a beautiful moment because you knew that God had spoken. <laughs> and that's all we wanted to do because he's given so much for us that we wanted to give back to him. It's good, isn't it, to look at Jesus crucified. You know, one time when I was um, meditating upon the cross, you know how you try to meditate upon the cross? I don't know whether you do, but I do. And um, I'm sure you do at times. You've tried to meditate upon the cross. And um, I was working at it, and I was, I was trying to get inside of what Jesus felt like, you see. And what I was meditating on was the time when he was being nailed to the cross. And I could hear the, the, the hammer going, hitting the nails, and then bang, bang. And, and, and I, could, I could see the body writhing and all that sort of stuff. And then I started to feel what I thought what Jesus was feeling like, you see. And I thought to myself, I'm the son of God. Oh, get up and smash these guys, right? <laughs> so I was going to smash them. How dare they do this to me? <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's not Jesus, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we've got that in us, haven't we? But it, and if you read Luke's Gospel, at the very moment when Jesus was being nailed, that's when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that way he broke the cycle of violence in the world. All of us have had our lives touched in some way by violence, unfortunately. You know, we've had some violence made against ourselves or we've experienced it in our families in some way. But he's broken the cycle of violence. But all it needs is for you and I to turn and everybody else in the human race to turn to Jesus and accept and take hold of the peace that he has won for us. I heard in the hearts of many over this weekend that desire for peace. We do become troubled, don't we? We become anxious, we're, we're anxiety-ridden sort of people. Uh, it's part of our, our human condition. But when we come to the foot of the cross, we can find peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. He promised that at the Last Supper when he said to the apostles, peace I leave you, my own peace I give you. Not as the world tries to give it to you, not that peace, but my own peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. Now he will come into 
what you might experience as a sort of a mess in your life. He hasn't remained distant and aloof, way up there in the heavenlies, looking down benignly upon the world and saying, oh, well, we'll give that one a blessing, that one over there, overlook that one. No, he's not like that, right? He's right with us. This is the meaning of, of God becoming one of us. He entered into our human condition. He took upon himself all of the woundedness of our human condition. So he hung on that cross for you and for me. Just an image of that that comes to mind. Some of you would be familiar with John Vanier. John Vanier, who sort of started the Lash communities, where you know, volunteers work with, over a period of time, and live with people with very uh, significant disabilities. And that gives them a sense of their worth and dignity. It's a beautiful ministry, really. Some of our brothers actually do that in Canberra. That's great. You see them coming back, actually, built up themselves through having been with the poorest of the poor. It's beautiful. Having been with... Because they, they, they're ministered to by these people. But anyway, there was one young man in, in one of the houses of the Lash community that John was visiting, and he had a real in incontinence problem. He couldn't, um, you know, he's always sort of uh, wetting his pants. And he was about 14, but it hadn't sort of worked for him yet. And also he hadn't yet spoken. You know, he had significant sort of autistic problems. Uh, and so anyway, the volunteers are always very good. But in this case, they were starting to get a bit sort of <laughs> antsy about it all because here he was, he'd done it again. You know, on the floor uh, with all his mess, right? And he's crying and, there, and there's a volunteer sort of, uh, you know, you've got to stop this, you've got to stop it. It's, it's bad, it's wrong. So John comes onto the scene and he sees this and instead of saying anything, he just simply sat down in the mess with the, the young boy, put his arm around him and for the first time the boy spoke. You see the power of love. And this is the way that God has loved us. He's come into our mess. You know how sometimes you can feel my life's a mess? Well, he's, <laughs> well, he, he's come right into that. And so he ennobles your mess, as it were. <laughs> now, he's, he's not distant from you. He's God with you and loves you intensely and desires to see you rise up. Oh, praise the Lord. So... Yeah, he, he wants to see you arise, not to be smothered by your troubles and problems and difficulties and the things that weigh you down so heavily, not to be oppressed. No, he's come to set the captives free. You know, we are meant to walk in freedom. We'll always walk, as been said over the weekend, with a lot of imperfection. Don't worry about your imperfections. That's what attracts God to you. No, he, he didn't come for the perfect. He came for you and I who are quite weak. That's who he came for. It takes us a while to realize this, huh? No, he, he was very clear with the Pharisees because they thought they had it all together. And they were the virtuous ones. And, and, and so they were criticizing him for being amongst the sinners and the prostitutes and the, <laughs> the, the sort of public sinner type of people, tax collectors and that. Uh, now, they were criticizing him. And Jesus says, no, I... You know, I, the doctor doesn't come to those who are well. He comes to those who are sick. You know, I didn't come for the virtuous. I came for sinners. I came for those who need. You see, so if you're feeling your neediness, then he's right with you. He's right there in the midst of that need. But if you're there saying, I don't need Jesus, well, of course, you're the proud Pharisee at the front of the temple saying, oh, look at me, I'm doing well, huh? But the tax collector at the back there is just saying, crying out, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And that's the one that went home at right with God. Huh? And that's how we come tonight to the Lord. Just as we are in our weakness, our brokenness, our sinfulness. You know, we've been to the sacrament of reconciliation. How precious a gift it is to hear those words, you know. I absolve you. You know? And you know that that's the words of Christ himself, absolving you of your sins. How wonderful is that? That's such a beautiful gift, isn't it? But we know our journey is not going to be a perfect journey, even though we've all been scrubbed up for a while. <laughs> but, 
But the Lord doesn't expect us to have it all together. Now, just about the sacrament of reconciliation, I'll share this story with you too because it's um, somewhat along the, the theme, I think. Um, I was in a, uh, another country and um, I was hearing confessions and I, had, I was in the confessional room and people were coming in. And I was seated. And Now, I'm not going to tell you that anyone's confession, don't worry. Um, we <laughs> but I can tell you things around it, right? So what happened is that the door opened and this woman came in. Now, she was immaculately dressed. A beautiful gown right down to her, her, her feet. And, and obviously, you know, well-groomed, etc. And she had this beautiful brunette hair right down to her shoulders. But I looked at her face as she came in and I thought, oh, a troubled soul. And then to my great surprise... She fell to her feet in front, through her knees in front of me and then she was down at my feet and she was weeping and I could feel the warmth of her tears on my sandaled toes, right? And in my humanity, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, she'll smell my sandals. <laughs> She was the real McCoy. Look, she was honestly like, and, and she was there for quite a while, you know. And I thought of Jesus in the gospel, remember, when the woman came in, in Luke's gospel in Luke 7, and she came in. I felt a bit like that. I'm trying to think, feel like Jesus, but I felt very awkward. <laughs> and, but it was like that because she, she obviously was weeping for, because she had been touched by the Lord. And, and that, t that touch enabled her to come in to expose vulnerably her sinfulness. And so finally she, she knelt up and she did confess. And it took a while. And then uh, I gave her the absolution. At the end of that, she grabbed hold of my hands and she looked me straight in the eye with such a beautiful glowing look because she'd been delivered and she said thank you thank you thank you and as she said that I knew she wasn't talking to me she was talking to Christ who she had found in the priest and had set her free and I thought to myself Lord if you only ordained me just for that that would have been enough but of course there's so many more you almost killed us tonight with the second wave. <laughs> <laughs> so praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that sacrament because, you see, it's a sacrament of mercy. It's a sacrament of the Lord's immense love for us. When what he won for us on the cross has been ministered to us and you have received that grace of his mercy and nobody earns mercy. We can't earn it. It's gift from God. Sheer gift. The gift of grace. It's amazing grace. We just sang it, didn't we? Amazing grace. And that reminded me of another story. And this was in South Africa. You know, after um, Nelson Mandela came into power, they had a, a Truth uh, and Justice Commission. Uh, and it was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was. Uh, instead of having a Nuremberg trial for those who were guilty of the atrocities during the apartheid era, instead of doing that, they actually had a beautiful sort of thing where anybody who had offended, and many had, uh, and, and had been guilty of injustices, as long as they came forward to the Reconciliation Commission and publicly confessed that it was possible that they'd be given a reprieve from their penalties. So here we are, there was a, a, a place in, in South Africa where a woman had lost her husband and her son. She'd lost both of them in an atrocious way. Firstly, they'd taken her son from their home, this is the white police, had taken her son from the home and they had put him to death and then burnt his body so it would never be found. And then a couple of years later, they attacked the home again 
And they pulled out her husband and before her very eyes, they tied him to a lot of tires and they burnt the tires and he was burnt to death before her very eyes. And now she's in the courtroom uh, and everybody in the town is gathered there. The policeman responsible for it, Mr. Vanderbrook, was there with other police, both black and white, who'd been responsible for this horrific incident. And so Mr. Vanderbrook got up and he asked forgiveness and he was weeping as he did it and asked that his men may be able to come back into the society rather than being put to prison. And after he had spoken, the widow was asked by Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was the, the leader of this thing, do you have anything to say to Mr. Vanderbrook? And she said, yes, I do. She said, I've lost my son, my son and I've lost my husband, but I have not lost love. She said, I'd, I'd want Mr. Vanderbrook to go to the place where my husband died and to pick up the dirt, whatever he can find there, and give him an honourable funeral. And then she said, I want Mr. Vanderbrook to come to my place, which was like a hovel out on the edges of the city, to come to my place twice a month and I'll show him a bit of love. And to prove to him that I've forgiven him, I'm now going to go over to embrace him. So she started to move to embrace him. The whole assemble, assembly began to sing Amazing Grace. But Mr. Vanderbrook didn't hear the singing, nor was he able to receive the hug because he had collapsed. He had just been overwhelmed by the gift of mercy. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of Jesus crucified for you and for me. This is the heart of Jesus who now risen and whose holy wounds are extended to you tonight for you to reach out to him for the healing that you need in your life. Whether it is the shame, whether it is the fear, whether it's the feeling forgotten, whether it's the rejection, whatever the pain is, whatever the struggle is, we can bring our wounded heart to Jesus. And what I'm asking is a little bit more than that. Because Jesus gave the last drop of his blood for you, because he's given himself completely for you, and he held you in his heart when he was on the cross. This is a truth that it might be hard for us to understand because we're so scientifically prone. But in reality, that's true. He died for you. He hung on that cross for you. He gave it all. And so because of that, I'm uh, inviting you to make a response to his great love. That out of gratitude for the way he has loved you, the way he has redeemed you, the way he has set you free, the way he continues to love you, that you will open your heart to receive him. That you will let him, you will exercise your will to say yes, yes to Jesus. That you'll let him come and be the Lord of your life. Because he truly wants to be the Lord of your life. But he will never force his way in. He knocks on the door of each heart here tonight. But that door does not have an outside handle. That door only has an inside handle. And so you have to open the door yourself and welcoming him in. There are many rooms maybe in your house and you need to invite him into all the rooms in your house, not just a selective few. You heard about the person who was... Um, coming in to invite Jesus into the house, right? 
And Jesus, come, this beautiful room here, it's just lovely. You've got to be in this room. Oh, yes, that's beautiful. I like that room. But I want to go into that one over there. Oh, not that one, Jesus. That's the one you sort of slam the door on and push every all the rubbish into him. Uh, and then you're going up the stairs. Uh, I'd like to go into this room, Jesus. No, oh, not that one. Because that's got written over it, my money. <laughs> and then he's going further. Oh, I will go into this room. No, not that one, Jesus. Because that one's got written over it, my sexual life. So the, don't be selective, though. Yeah, invite him into every room. Huh? Invite him into your whole life. Let him reign within you. Huh? Let him fill you with his love as he really wants to. We used to sing a song called His Banner Over Me Is Love. Do you remember that? I can't sing it now. How's it going? My beloved is mine and I am his and his banner over me is love. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> that was a bit off key, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I once said to our music minister, I'd like to join you. They said, no, we think you've got movement. <laughs> yeah, so, but his banner over me is love. And there's sort of two sides to that image, right? Uh, one side is, of course, the spousal side. You know, he, his banner over me is love. He's my beloved, and he chooses me, and he finds me as his delight. And he finds you as his delight, huh? It was in that last uh, thing on the, on the screen. He finds you delightful. Personally, he delights over you. He's excited about you. you know, he loves you intensely. Uh, so yes, you're, he, he has a spousal relationship with you and invites you into that spousal relationship. Huh? But there's another side to that image, which in a way is more masculine, I guess. But you Joan of Arc people, you'll appreciate it. Like, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's more like a military image, you see, because you know, in the ancient times when the... Um, the armies lined up against one another, the king would have his standard, right? And wherever the king's standard was held high, then the, the army would rally around it, you see, and they'd go forward with his standard. And when they won the territory, they put down the king's standard in the territory saying, this belongs to the king, huh? When they defeated the other army. So it's like that. His banner over me is love, he wants to win the territory with his love, the territory being your heart. If you'll allow yourself to be won by him, he wants to win you, to conquer those voices within you that are more of the evil spirit than of the Holy Spirit, right? He wants to win you, to capture your heart with love. So he can put his banner down in your heart and he's the king, right? and nobody else. You got it? Are you willing for that? This is the night when you can choose the Lord in that way. Another image you might like to use is like, if we had a chair here, I could sit in the chair, right? And, but then if I'm sitting in the chair, then nobody else can sit in the chair. So inside your heart, you have a chair, right? Now, who's sitting on that chair? It's like a throne, huh? Are you sitting on the throne of your heart? You need to get out of the chair and let Jesus on the throne of your heart. Hmm? So it's giving it over to the Lord, huh? That's what I'm inviting. Yeah, music. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so as the music goes, just a little bit of... Hold on. Um, we'll... <laughs> We'll have that sort of call, right? Like, but I forgot to tell you about Pam. Pam, yeah, Pam. Mm. Yeah, you can read it. She's in one of my books. But um, I won't tell you which one, then you'll have to buy them all. Yeah, Pam, you see, she came to our summer school. But before that, 
she'd had a sort of a terrible upbringing, like she, her, her father had sort of a bit, bit rotten to her. And she had this sort of thing for herself. She just wanted to be loved, needed to be loved and, and not received the love. And she was angry about not being loved. And so she took on drugs and she went into the grog, uh, all sorts of uh, patterns of behaviour. But it just wasn't working for Pam, you know. And she was getting more and more out of it. She ended up sort of marrying this guy who abused her badly and then ended up in, in jail. Unfortunate thing where she had a child from him but unfortunately, you know, was, was forced into aborting the child. Pam was sort of in a bit of a mess and, and not knowing how to get out of it. Her mother, as good mothers do, had, did a novena to St. Jude. And at the, the last day of the novena, Pam arrives home, desperate. How about that? Mother's prayer, huh? And so then uh, they arranged for her to go to a prayer meeting uh, with uh, some of the young people and she started to get attracted by the music and everything. So she ended up coming to one of our summer schools. So she turned up at the summer school. I've got permission to tell the story. So she turned up at the summer school, you know, and she said as soon as she walked into the door, she just felt overwhelmed by the happiness and the joy of the people. And she felt really envious. Why can't I have that, you know? She wanted that joy that she could see in the faces of people, right? So anyway, the song that got her, and this is a song I wanted to sort of mention, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try and sing this one too. <laughs> this one I'll do better with, I think, right? <laughs> you know this song? Crucified, lay behind the stone, live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. He took the fall and thought of me, Above all, Jesus, crucified, lay behind the stone. You know, he lived to die, rejected and alone. Like a rose trampled on the ground. This is the song that caught her. And so she went to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. It was all over. Like um, she just uh, had a whole new life. And she's here tonight. I've got permission. But that's beautiful, isn't it? Because she felt trampled on the ground, like a rose, and she's a beautiful rose, but trampled on the ground. But Jesus took the fall for her and thought of her above all, as he did for you too, and he thought of you above all. So that's the crucified Lord we're talking about, now risen, present with us now, calling you to make a response, to say yes to him, and opening your heart, letting him take the territory, letting him love you and love you and love you. Be captive to his love. It's so wonderful to know the love of God. That's why he came. Thanks. Let's go. Sisterhood is a place like no other. It's a chance to have a group of women with the same ideas, the same um, vocation in life. It's something that I find very, very um, spiritual. Um, and a, a place where we can come and enjoy ourselves, uh, meet new people, but also uh, discover a lot more about our inner, inner selves. Um, and it's a great, a great place to come uh, to learn more about uh, the Holy Spirit, um, your, your feelings about things, and uh, it's somewhere where you can reflect and find a really good understanding of what you want out of life. There's been so much wisdom shared with us this weekend, so much to take home with us and to take back into our daily lives. And we're so glad that you could join us here at Sisterhood Conference 2018. A lot of talk in our church today about the new evangelization and we might ask well what's new about the new evangelization one thing that's new is that we're trying to renew the faith in people who should already be catholic should already be christian individuals families communities whole cultures that need to rediscover the gospel and so what's new is that they're getting a new shot in the arm of faith of evangelization another thing that's new about it is the way that we do that and the new media and groups like Shalom World TV are very important for bringing the gospel anew to our cultures, to our families, 
to each of us individually. And so I encourage all the viewers of Shalom World TV and I encourage uh, Shalom World TV themselves to keep up the good work, uh, to keep watching this channel and to keep up the good work of presenting the Catholic faith to our world today. Shalom World, God's own channel.